and welcome to this training program on stroke, which has been especially designed to assist paramedical staff in the National Ambulance Service of Ireland. Upon completion of this training module, you will know how to diagnose acute stroke in the field using the face arm speech test fast. Be aware of the urgent requirement for ambulance transfer of the stroke patient to the emergency department of the acute hospital, which provides hyperacute stroke assessment and treatment. And the pivotal role of paramedic pre-notification of the receiving emergency department of the impending arrival of the acute stroke patient. Until recent years, there were no effective treatments available for stroke patients. Randomized controlled trials have convincingly demonstrated that acute stroke morbidity can be significantly reduced by stroke thrombolysis, which opens up the blocked artery causing ischemic stroke, and also by treatment of the stroke or brain attack victim in a stroke unit. There, the stroke patient is provided with early and ongoing multidisciplinary assessment and rehabilitation by a team of experts, including medical, nursing and therapy staff from a variety of disciplines, including physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech and language therapy, dietetics, medical, social workers and psychologists, amongst others. It is critically important that acute stroke patients are admitted as quickly as possible to the acute hospital following stroke onset. Remember, time is brain and that 2 million brain cells die for every minute which passes before the acute stroke patient gets treatment. Stroke is uh, one of the leading causes of death and disability in the Western world. It's the number three cause of death. It's the commonest cause of acquired disability in the community. In Ireland, we see about 10,000 strokes per annum. Uh, one in six of the population, adult population will get a stroke in his or her lifetime. While the mortality with acute stroke is dropping considerably with improved treatments, the, the level of disability is uh, still significant. 50 to 60% of stroke survivors have significant disability. So the onus is on us, I think, in the healthcare system to provide effective care and, uh, and to use the proven tools that we have at our disposal as best we can. The two treatments that we have in the last 15 or 20 years, stroke thrombolysis or clot post treatment and stroke unit care. Stroke unit care reduces the risk of death or disability by about a quarter. All patients, all severities of stroke, all ages, men and women can benefit. So it's a widely applicable treatment. Stroke thrombolysis for a smaller subgroup um, the earlier that treatment is given, the better. As an example, the number of patients we need to treat to get a good response within the first 90 minutes of a stroke is three. Between 90 and 180 minutes, it's eight. Beyond that, again, it's 14. So you can see the earlier the treatment is given, the better. And what thrombolysis does is reduces disability levels after stroke. So what causes a stroke? About 80% of acute strokes are due to occlusion of a blood vessel resulting in an ischemic stroke. The remaining 20% of strokes are due to rupture of the brain blood vessel leading to haemorrhage. On the ischemic side, there are several mechanisms potentially that could cause that. One of the more common ones is a blood clot in the heart or in the great vessels of the neck and chest that flies off up into the brain and causes blockage of a blood vessel. And then the manifestations that result depend on the part of the brain affected. In other uh, cases, the uh, small blood vessels in the brain, very tiny blood vessels become blocked. They don't tend to produce as severe a stroke. So there are a variety of different mechanisms and part of you know, the evaluation of any stroke patient is for us to figure out what the mechanism of the stroke is. And once we know that, then we're better fixed at giving the best preventive therapy thereon. Most commonly, the acute symptoms of stroke include muscle paralysis and loss of sensation affecting part or all of one side of the body, speech disturbance, loss of vision and balance. So what causes an ischemic stroke? Most ischemic strokes are due to embolism or occlusion of the carotid arteries. About 20% are due to disease in the posterior circulation, that is the vertebrobasilar arterial system. The symptoms of a stroke are always sudden and abrupt. That's one of the hallmarks of stroke. Um, acute loss of power or weakness, loss of sensation, loss of vision. 
Diagnosis of stroke by paramedical staff is greatly enhanced by use of the face arm speech test or FAST. Using FAST, properly trained paramedical staff have been shown to be equally skilled in diagnosing stroke as general practitioners and emergency department medical staff. The three components of the FAST include sudden onset of new facial weakness, sudden onset of new arm weakness, sudden onset of inability to speak properly. In, in our public education campaigns, we try to keep the messages simple. So most people are familiar with the face arm speech test. Weakness of the face, acute onset. Sudden change in the speech, again, sudden onset. And uh, weakness of, a, of, of an arm. Any one of those symptoms positive means the patient is fast positive. We can capture about 90% of all strokes using the face arm speech test. So it's not perfect. The other group of patients that where the face arm speech test will not be positive are patients with what we call posterior circulation strokes, brainstem, cerebellum. Typical symptoms of posterior circulation stroke can include any of the following. Acute loss of balance or unsteadiness walking. Acute vertigo, spinning sensation, especially if accompanied by difficulty with walking due to poor balance. Acute loss of vision or difficulty seeing the newspaper or TV. Acute slurred speech or difficulty swallowing food or fluids. Acute clumsiness and movements of the arms or legs. Acute double vision. Please remember these acute symptoms and that they might well be due to stroke, especially if they occur very suddenly. If so, and the patient can be transported to the emergency department, arriving within 4.5 hours of symptom onset, then intravenous thrombolytic therapy may be a possible option. The sudden nature of any neurological symptom should raise the suspicion in the caregiver's mind that this, is, this could possibly be, be, a, be a stroke. As many as 80% of all strokes are potentially preventable by treatment of risk factors and adopting a healthy lifestyle. Risk factors for stroke include hypertension, raised cholesterol, cigarette smoking, diabetes mellitus, obesity, diet high in saturated fat and salt, lack of physical exercise, high levels of stress, and account for 90% of all strokes. But the ambulance service and the paramedical staff have a huge role to play in acute stroke uh, management because if they can recognise that it's a stroke, th we then get you know, a, a, a blue lights and sirens response. Time is brain, so the quicker that it is re appreciated that somebody has a stroke, the quicker the ambulance is going quickly to that patient, quick assessment, bringing that patient then to the nearest emergency department where there is the capacity for acute stroke assessment. That is what we're all after. And not only that, but the paramedical staff use the face arm speech test to assist them with the diagnosis in the, fi in the field. And if that's positive, we they must ring ahead the emergency department to say, fast positive patient incoming, expected time of arrival. So we can have the stroke team or the medical team there at the door to meet the patient the CT scanner turned on or access to the CT scanner cleared so we can get in quickly and get a scan and make our decisions. So how do we perform a fast assessment? So Eugene, how are you? Yes. Eugene, I'm just going to uh, perform a fast assessment, okay? And a fast assessment is to check to see if you've had a stroke. Okay. Okay? okay. So the first thing that I'd like you to do, Eugene, is to give me a smile. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. So what we have here is that Eugene has a, a slight facial droop on his right hand side. Okay. The second thing I'm going to do, Eugene, if you can raise both of your arms to shoulder length. Okay. And as you can see, uh, Eugene has just been able to raise one hand on this occasion and this one uh, remains dormant. Okay. In the position. The third thing that I'm going to check now with you, uh, Eugene, is your speech. And I'd like you to um, give me uh, numbers from one to seven. So if you can start with one. One. Okay. Two. Two. C. Three. Four. Four. Five. Five. Six. Six. Seven. Okay. That's perfect. Thanks. 
And what we've elicited there is that Eugene has difficulty pronouncing uh, the, the numbers. Although I can understand you, Eugene, mm -hmm. uh, he has difficulty in pronunciation. Okay, and the last thing that I, I'd like to find is the time that this actually happened. So we would be asking people when you had your stroke, okay. what time of the day it would have happened at. Okay. And the reason for that is so that we can get you expert help when we arrive at the hospital. Speech difficulty can present itself in many ways. Let's take a moment just to look at a couple of different presentations. And how has your communication or your speech been affected since the stroke? Well, I'm feeling uh, in a very high delight. I was telling an stroke and I remembered that I was having a stroke and I was having Sometimes I was the having um infrared infestation. The man that we saw first presents with aphasia. Approximately a third of people who've had a stroke um, will present with aphasia. And aphasia is a difficulty uh, with communication when the language centre of the brain has been damaged, and that's usually on the left side of the, the brain. And people who've had aphasia can have difficulty with understanding what other people are saying to them, uh, what they're reading, uh, words that they're saying themselves and sentences. Uh, when they're writing, using gesture, or even sign language. I went and said I back in a cup of coffee. I had to invite me people at home. So, but, uh, I knew the coordination was tough to do all. Okay. Uh, but, uh, I, I, I drank the coffee, but I, I spilled it a bit, a bit, uh, before I, when, when I got it okay. at the cover. The shop. Dysarthria is um, also as a result of stroke and it's when there's a difficulty forming words or individual sounds because there's been some weakness of muscles or difficulty coordinating the muscles for speech and those muscle weaknesses can happen at the point of breathing, here at the point of the larynx or the muscles of the mouth. Remember, a fast positive patient who is transported urgently and arrives in the emergency department of the hospital within 4.5 hours of symptom onset may be suitable for treatment with thrombolytic therapy to open up the blocked artery. Intravenous thrombolytic therapy is the only licensed treatment for acute ischemic stroke. It must be given within 4.5 hours of stroke symptom onset. The earlier the treatment is given, the better the patient's chances of having a good functional outcome post-stroke. As well as the FAST assessment, it is important that you follow the other steps laid out in the Clinical Practice Guideline for Stroke. Ensure adequate ABCs and blood pressure. Establish the patient's oxygen and glucose level. Give supplemental oxygen to maintain an SpO2 reading of between 94 to 98% in the majority of patients and in COPD titrate to maintain an SpO2 of 92%. If the capillary blood glucose is less than 4.0, treat hypoglycemia using the clinical practice guideline for same. Measure and record the Glasgow Coma Scale. Complete a thrombolysis checklist. Focus on when the signs and symptoms started or when the patient was last seen without new complaints. In some cases, pinning down the exact time the stroke began can be very difficult, such as with patients who live alone. In those cases, ask family or care providers when the patient last seemed normal. Well, above and beyond using the FAST test, there are many other things. Um, the paramedics can ascertain the time of symptom onset, which is a key piece of information. Or perhaps the, the stroke occurred on waking. They can help to ascertain which, which, which applies. Details about the patient's past medical history, their medications, allergies. If they've had a previous stroke and there were some residual signs, they might be able to ascertain, is this something new above and beyond what was there before? Also, such important information uh, when the patient comes to be seen in the emergency department. Uh, a c contact details, who the patient's GP might be, if there's a family member, 
bring the family member if possible to the ED in the ambulance or if not possible give get a mobile phone number so we can contact that family member all of this information is is just so important and, and really does help the acute assessment of our stroke patients an appropriately completed PCR would allow you to gather information that the emergency department doctor will need before thrombolysis can be considered. Thrombolytics need to be administered within 4.5 hours of stroke onset. Do not administer aspirin in case of suspected stroke or TIA cases. Protect any impaired limbs from injury. Patients may not be able to feel or move their arms or legs if they begin to get injured. Identify an appropriate acute hospital facility for transport, namely a hospital known to have an acute stroke system of care where the stroke patient can be assessed clinically immediately upon arrival, have a CT brain scan performed 24-7 and decision made regarding the stroke patient's suitability for thrombolytic therapy. Practitioners should follow national and local access protocol to identify appropriate receiving facilities. Pre-notify the hospital of the incoming fast positive patient and the expected time of arrival. This facilitates the receiving hospital to activate the acute stroke team who can be on hand to assess the patient clinically immediately upon arrival in the emergency department. Take the paramedic's handover report and proceed to CT scanning. If a family member is available and willing, they may accompany the stroke patient in the ambulance during transportation to the hospital. Pre-notification of the hospital allows time for the CT radiographer to travel to the hospital as quickly as possible out of hours, facilitating CT scan to be done as soon as possible. Key performance targets in the acute hospital are CT scan completion within 30 minutes of the acute stroke patient's arrival in ED and a 60-minute door-to-needle time for start of thrombolytic therapy. Acute, potentially life-threatening compromise of the patient's airway or circulation means that the ambulance must divert to the nearest acute hospital to allow stabilization of same as a first priority. It is important to remember that a number of conditions can mimic the symptoms of acute stroke. These conditions must be kept in mind during the initial clinical assessment by the ambulance paramedic in the field. Stroke mimics are an important differential diagnosis always. So common examples would be seizure, tonic-clonic seizure or generalized seizure. Some of those patients after the seizure can have what looks like a stroke. So knowing about a history of epilepsy or somebody, you know, a family member or a caregiver observing the onset of the symptoms may observe a seizure activity, critically important to, to, to have that information. Extremes of blood glucose, either a low blood glucose, as I already mentioned, but also a very high blood glucose, like 30 to 40, can also produce a stroke lookalike. And the treatment for that is the treatment of the blood sugar, not giving clot bus drugs. In the younger patients, more particularly, migraine is an important diagnostic consideration. So knowing about a history of migraine, and again, the migraine symptoms mimicking stroke, they're slightly different in terms of the tempo of the symptoms and how they progress than, than, than say, an ischemic stroke. Um, a patient who might have a history of severe headaches going on for a period of time, or if the symptoms were not sudden in onset, these are all little tips that might suggest an alternative diagnosis. And we, the one thing we do not want to be doing is giving clot bus treatment or stroke thrombolysis to patients who do not have stroke. So consideration of the presence of a stroke mimic is always uppermost in our minds. In the next sequence we see how the face arm speech test is used at an incident. Amman's emergency, can you verify your phone number for me please? It's at 453-1314. Neve is at home with her husband Barry and discovers he's unwell. She rings the ambulance control centre. Tell me why you think it's a stroke. Well, I, I was just in the other room and um, when I came in, he just didn't look well and he was mumbling and he can't speak. The control centre operator talks to the caller and asks her to conduct a brief, fast assessment. The control centre identify that the patient may be suffering from a stroke and dispatch an ambulance under blue lights 
immediately. Paramedics arrive on scene and enter the house. Okay, Barry. Hello, Barry. I'm Carl from the National Ambulance Service, and this is my colleague, Julian. Have you uh, any pain at the moment? No. Wow. Do you remember what happened to you, Barry? No. Wow. No. Have you been feeling well up to now? I'm going to put something on your finger, Barry, sorry. Is your husband uh, under any medical care? He, yeah, he's on medication for high blood pressure. Blood pressure. All right, sorry, yeah. Sorry. He's okay. He's taken warfarin. So your husband is on warfarin? Yeah, he put is, something yeah. On your finger, yeah. Barry. Barry, would you give me a smile there? Can you show me your teeth? Okay. I want you to give me your hands and hold them out in front of you, please. You just hold them there. Okay. Barry, can you remember what happened to you? Not too well. Not too well. And how long ago since this uh, incident happened on this morning? I'd say maybe uh, about half an hour ago. Okay. And up to that he was fine. fine. Everything yeah. was good with him. No, he was fine before that, yeah. Okay. And this is new to your husband, yeah? Yeah, well, he had a stroke about eight years ago. Okay. He, he recovered really well from it. All right. Okay, Barry, I want to take your blood sugar there now. All right? I'm just going to take a little blood from your finger. Okay, Barry? I'm good. I'm just going to take your blood pressure at the same time, Barry. Sorry about that. Okay, Barry. Barry, you're going to feel a little pinch, okay? Let's just step away from the scene and look at why taking the blood glucose level is important. A low blood sugar or hypoglycemia, one of its manifestations is what looks like a stroke. A patient can be, appear to be paralyzed on one side of the body. And if, if that's not ascertained or appreciated, that can be very dangerous for the patient. But even more importantly, once you know th that there is a hypoglycemic um, um, episode intravenous glucose can abolish the symptoms there and then dramatically so it's it's so important let us go back to the scene his blood sugar is 6.1 one sixty over one or two okay So new onset of stroke, okay? Yeah, about a half an hour ago. The paramedics fill in the patient care report, ensuring they complete all necessary fields. For the initial clinical impression, this would include the time of onset, the findings of the primary survey, and also clinical impression. In this instance, they tick the stroke field. Under clinical observations, you should again note the time and date of observation, as well as other information including, but not limited to, the heart rate, respirate, saturation levels, SpO2, blood pressure, GCS, blood glucose level, and the FAST assessment results. Okay, Barry, I'm going to give you some oxygen now. It's just to help you there with your breathing. It's just through your nose, all right? That's it, good man. Are you feeling okay now yourself? Okay, he will be okay. We're going to look after him now. Okay. All right? Barry, uh, your wife told me that you had a stroke some eight years ago. Are we allergic to any medication? No, he's not, no. Are we on? We're on medication for yeah, he's high blood pressure, you said? That's right, Janet. Okay. Warfarin. And morphine, but he has no allergies. No, no, he has. Okay, and uh, you've been fine. Yeah, everything been, has been okay yeah. up to about an hour ago. He's been really fit and well, yeah. Okay, 
OK, that's good, Barry. So when we are going to the hospital, will you bring that medication with oh, you? Will, yeah. When is the last time Barry had something to eat? Barry? He had his breakfast this morning. OK, Barry, I'm going to go out to the ambulance and get a chair to bring you out to it. And I'm going to leave you with my colleague here, Julian. OK? OK, love, I'll look after you now. Be OK. The paramedics then carefully lift the patient into the chair, securing him with the safety straps, and then wheel him into the ambulance. You all right there, Barry? OK, come on. I'm going to put you in now. Once secured in the back of the ambulance, the paramedics then connect him back up to the monitors. The paramedics then course through the incident to the hospital. Five one two to control over. Control receiving you there, five one two. Uh, will you take the details of a uh, Nash Eye there, please? Yeah, five one two. Uh, go ahead, there. I'm ready. A male, fifty eight years of age, re recent onset of stroke. Fast positive for a half an hour. GCS 14. He's alert. BM 6.1. Blood pressure 160 on 102. Heart rate 44. Respirations 18. ETA at the hospital 15 minutes. Over. Thank you for one two. Just to confirm, it's a 58-year-old male, recent onset of a stroke, fast positive for the last 30 minutes, GCS 14, the end is 6.1, AP is 160 over 102, heart rate is 44, respiration rate 18, and ETA is a hospital approximately 15 minutes. And thank you, 512, I will have the hospital on standby. Let's take a moment to reflect on this scenario. In the case study, we saw excellent practice. Firstly, the ambulance was going with blue lights and sirens, so the stroke case was being treated as a medical emergency. When the paramedics arrived, they were very quick to ascertain the time of onset of the symptoms, that they were acute, what the symptoms were. The paramedical staff used the face arm speech test to assist them with the diagnosis in the, in the field. They were very quick to ascertain details about the patient's past history, including the fact that the patient had a previous stroke, but that the new signs and symptoms were new, which is a very important piece of the history. That the patient was on warfarin, which is very relevant in terms of the potential causes of the stroke and how you might treat the stroke. The blood pressure was checked oxygen level in the blood was checked, the blood glucose was checked, very important. A and also the paramedics en route to the emergency department were pre-notifying the receiving emergency department of an incoming fast positive patient and that's so important because that gives heads up to the team in the hospital so they can have the stroke team there at the door and the CT scanner ready to get the patient into it as quickly as possible so that treatment decisions can be made. Another significant area that all practitioners should be aware of is transient ischemic attacks. Well, in lay terms, a, a TIA is often referred to as a mini-stroke. So the symptoms are like those of a stroke. They're sudden in onset, but they only last a few minutes. The average TIA is lasting maybe 10 or 15 minutes. And because something, you know, you can imagine symptoms that are short-lived are frequently thought to be of no great importance. A TIA is also a medical emergency. The risk of stroke over the next 48 hours is about 5%. Within the first week, it's about 7 or 8%. And within three months, you're up to 10 or 15%. Some subgroups have even higher risk. To, you know, and we can identify those after assessment. It is so important that patients with TIAs or many strokes are brought to expert medical assessment as quickly as possible so that we can prevent strokes. There is one famous study from the United Kingdom that shows that rapid assessment reduces the risk of stroke by 80%.
So I think it's important that the general public understand the importance of a TIA, but I think it's also important for everybody within the healthcare system to understand the importance. We all have a role to play to help patients, members of the general public, to point them in the right direction. And it's important that everybody understands the importance of a TIA, the need for treatment, the, the significant risk associated with a TIA, so that we can prevent for the devastation of, a, of, of an acute stroke later. As we have learned in this program, time is brain, and a quick diagnosis and treatment can significantly reduce the long-term effects of stroke and mortality rates. In the following scene, we will hear from Olive, a patient who, because of a fast stroke diagnosis, has thankfully had a very positive outcome. We'd have been in town doing Christmas shopping, and we came back as usual and uh, had our tea, watch the television and it's a night that I go out for the tours tonight but it just happened the night that I just changed my mind and Olive went up to bed and she came down for a cup of tea and she went back upstairs and I was sitting watching the television and I heard a thump and I didn't know what it was so I jumped up and I ran up the stairs I knew it was a, a stroke from the sound of the voice there was a slur in the voice and I knew it was a stroke because I seen the advertisement on the television of the man having a stroke and the advertisement was to get as quick as possible that it was either life or death. So I had fallen. I couldn't move left or right. I hadn't got the sense to, I hadn't move. to move. And I knew something had to happen to me but I just, I just couldn't fathom what it was, uh, I just couldn't move. And he couldn't get me from, from behind the door. So, so I went over and got a neighbour, and his wife came over, and his daughter, and they inched in, and we moved the door over, and we got all of it out, and in the meantime, the ambulance came, and they were very quick, and asked me a few questions, and the questions he asked, any medication I was on. And lucky enough, I had a prescription there that the medication that she does be on and I took that to the hospital with me and I saved an awful lot of bother. So when I went to the hospital, the doctor that looked at her said, she had to having a stroke. And I said to him, is it bad? He says, it's very bad, he says. And he says, uh, we think that we've got her in time. Well, I think that if I had been left because Leo changed his mind about going out that night but if I had been left it would have been a totally different outlook on it then I don't think I, w- I would have been as well now and like you know timing is, is really everything but uh, thank God I was caught in time Unfortunately the most common reason why patients do not get treated with clot bus treatment is that they arrive too late some of that delay is due to delay on the part of patient and families But what we want in the healthcare system is to be sure that all of the staff involved in the chain of survival understand that time is critically important. Time is brain. Two million brain cells die for every minute of delayed treatment in acute stroke. So everybody involved has a huge role to play and uh, it's only by having everybody involved functioning at a high level that we can get the best outcomes. So remember, time is brain and we all play a critical role in ensuring early diagnosis and treatment of stroke patients. Using tools such as the FAST assessment ensures that stroke patients are rapidly diagnosed and transported to an acute hospital for appropriate treatment. This, along with an appropriately completed PCR, will allow you to gather information that the emergency department doctor will need before thrombolysis can be considered. By adopting the training points outlined in this program, we can all help in reducing the instances of stroke mortality and morbidity.